Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is another update on the financial implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global economy. And in today's episode, I want to talk to you about oil. Now, oil is probably the biggest single issue relating to this war. Russia is one of the biggest exporters of oil, so therefore earns a lot of revenue from it. And prior to the invasion starting, the European markets were highly dependent on Russian oil. So it's been a critical issue. And directly following the invasion, oil prices skyrocketed and have been highly volatile for the last seven months. So in today's episode, I'll provide you with an update on the price cap that the G7 is trying to enforce on Russia. And that's obviously a challenging thing to be able to do to force somebody else to accept the price cap who doesn't want to accept it. So I'll go through how that's going to work, what the proposal is and what the latest developments are. We'll have a look at what's been happening to oil prices, because aside from the war, global supply and demand have a really big influence on the price. And we're now moving into a slowdown globally. So prices have started to creep back down. And as a direct result of that, OPEC, which is a consortium of some of the biggest oil exporters in the world, have recently had a meeting and they've made an announcement with regards to future production, which will have a direct impact on the price levels. So I'll talk you through exactly what OPEC is, which countries are involved in it, what the announcement is that they've just released, what the response is from the USA, and what the potential implications of this are in terms of legal action. The USA is now considering whether or not it should take the OPEC countries to court for anti-competitive practices. And of course, one of the reasons why the price of oil is such a hot topic right now is that oil is still the biggest single earner for Russia. Sanctions have been imposed by a variety of countries from the West, but some European countries are still buying oil directly, and Russia's trying to replace all of the sales that it's lost through the sanctions with increased sales from the Far East and the rest of the world. So we'll also have a look at what the impact of the OPEC announcement will be on Russia and Russia's revenues. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summaries to what I think the implications of everything we're discussing in today's video are for Russia and the global economy. So before we get started on all of that, if I could ask you for a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you could help me with that push to 200,000 subscribers, that would be amazing. Don't forget, I always include chapters in these videos. So if you don't have time to watch the entire thing from front to back, you can pick and choose which sections you'd like to watch. And if you'd like to support the channel, please have a look below where you'll find links to YouTube, super thanks and membership, as well as buy me a coffee, Patreon and Amazon links. And once again, thank you so much if you have supported the channel. I really appreciate it. And apologies if my voice sounds a bit funny today. I've had a bit of a problem with my throat. The USA and the West are currently working on a price cap plan that will be applied to all exports of Russian oil. Now, obviously, the concept of trying to put a price limit on oil deals that Russia is striking with other countries is quite challenging because the West has no involvement in those negotiations. But the way that they're trying to achieve this is by applying sanctions and measures against all of the cargo and insurance companies around the world so that it becomes very difficult for Russia to be able to actually transport and deliver that oil once the deals are signed. So the way that this price cap will be managed is that the buyer of the oil will have to produce paperwork to prove what price they've agreed with Russia. And only if that price is below a certain agreed level would they be able to obtain shipping insurance, brokerage, finance, navigation facilities, and all of the things associated to the actual shipping of the cargo. So essentially what this is doing is trying to close down the delivery options for Russia unless it drops its price to a level that's agreed by the G7. Now, Russia are obviously furious about this concept, and they've come out and stated that if a price cap is applied, then they will reduce all of their oil production and export and cause chaos in the global markets. And the Russian minister has said that the price of oil could end up rising to above $200 per barrel if Russia withdraws all of its exports. Now, in reality, doing that wouldn't actually be beneficial to Russia in the long term. As I mentioned in previous videos, if you're producing 10 million barrels of oil per day, you simply don't have anywhere to be able to store that volume of oil. You need to find a buyer who can take that from you so that you can keep producing another 10 million tomorrow and the next day and the next day. If you suddenly decide to stop exporting all of that oil, the only option that you have available to you is to stop that flow. You won't be able to store it, so you need to stop drawing all of the oil out of the ground. And if you're an oil producer, the last thing that you want to do is stop the flow of oil because you've set up these extremely expensive facilities. You've tapped down into the well. You've got everything lined up. 
If you then suddenly stop that flow, it will cause you major problems and potentially you may not be able to get that flow restarted. So the reality of the situation is that Russia won't actually be able to stop all of their exports. They need to keep finding markets. So the only way that this cap will become effective is if the G7 can persuade all of the countries in the world to sign up to it. And then Russia will have no choice because all of their buyers will say, well, we can only pay a certain amount. Otherwise, we can't actually organize delivery of all of this oil. So Russia essentially would be backed into a corner and they would be forced to agree to these terms and conditions. Otherwise, they're going to have to cap all of their oil wells, which would be a disaster. And they'd also lose all of the revenue at a time when they've got major sanctions against them anyway. And the key challenge for the G7 is to try to persuade India and China, who are the two largest buyers of Russian oil right now and are the biggest markets that Russia is targeting, to join in with the price cap concept. And Ben Harris, Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the US Treasury, has advised the Energy Intelligence Forum in London that the United States has held positive dialogue with both China and India with regards to the price cap. So this is a major development. And from India and China's perspective, the benefit of signing up to this price cap is obviously that they would be able to buy large amounts of oil for a very low price because this would be set at below market rates. It's been mentioned by the G7 that they'll agree a price that's slightly above the production cost for Russia. Now, we don't know officially what that level is, but I've seen speculation that it would be somewhere around $55 per barrel. So that's significantly below current market rates and obviously would have a massive impact on the amount of revenue that Russia would be collecting for the sale of all of its oil. So let's have a look at what's been happening to oil prices since the start of the Ukraine war. This chart shows the movement in oil prices over the last 12 months, and it shows the prices hit a low of $68 back on the 1st of December 2021. And then over the period of the next three months, we saw a steady increase in prices. And this was because of rising concerns that Russia were potentially thinking about making an invasion into Ukraine. And on the 23rd of February, which was the day before the invasion started, prices had risen to $92 per barrel. As soon as the invasion started, the price of oil skyrocketed. And it's shown on this graph to have hit a high point of $123, although it was reported that a number of trades took place at around $140. And in the period through to the start of June, we saw a lot of volatility in prices, but they remained high and on average traded at around $110 per barrel. This prolonged period of high oil prices resulted in increased inflation all around the world. And as a direct impact, central banks started to increase interest rates. The combination of high inflation and increasing interest rates caused a weakening in the global economy. And from the start of June, we have seen a general reduction in the price of oil. And by the end of September, prices had fallen to $85 per barrel, which is broadly speaking where they were this time last year. So you may be thinking that if prices are where they were this time last year, then there doesn't seem to be a problem. We've actually got away from the extremely high levels that we've had throughout the period of this war. However, if we expand the graph to show the movements over the last five years, you can see that in November 21, when prices were broadly speaking around $85 per barrel, that price represented a significant increase over the previous 12 months period because that period was impacted heavily by the COVID-19 pandemic. So at that time, the world economy was growing, it was bouncing back from the pandemic, and the global economy was looking forward to healthy growth in 2022. So from the perspective of the oil producers, the price of $85 per barrel in November 21 was actually a good level because it represented a big increase on where they'd been 12 months previously. However, if we jump back to the current situation, you can see that prices are now in decline and oil producers are now concerned that if this decline continues, that they will start losing significant amounts of revenue. And as a direct result of these concerns, OPEC have now decided that they want to limit their production. OPEC is the acronym for the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and was created in Baghdad, which is the capital of Iran, in 1960 by the five founding members who were Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. OPEC's stated objective is to coordinate and unify petroleum prices among member countries in order to secure fair and stable prices for petroleum producers, an efficient economic and regular supply of petroleum to consuming nations, 
and a fair return on capital to those investing in the industry. Over the past 50 years, the number of OPEC member countries has increased to include Qatar, Indonesia, Libya, the United Arab Emirates, Algeria, Nigeria, Ecuador, Gabon, Angola, Equatorial Guinea and Congo. However, Ecuador, Indonesia and Qatar have subsequently terminated their membership. In addition to full membership, OPEC also has a number of affiliated countries and this expanded group is referred to as OPEC+. Plus. And there are currently 10 associated countries which are Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Brunei, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, Mexico, Oman, Russia, South Sudan and Sudan. So in total, OPEC Plus is a consortium of 23 oil producing countries, all of whom have agreed to set production limits, which then regulates the amount of oil that's in the international markets and therefore will have a direct impact on the price of oil. Now, in order to assess the importance of OPEC Plus, let's look firstly at the list of oil producers and then we'll go on to look at the list of oil exporters. This list shows the top 10 oil producing countries in 2021 and you can see that right at the top is the USA producing around 11.5 million barrels per day. Russia is second with 10.5, Saudi Arabia a close third with 10.2, Canada comes in fourth at 4.7, Iraq fifth at 4.3, China comes in at 6 with around 4 million barrels per day. The UAE is 7th with around 3 million barrels. Brazil is 8th with 2.9. Kuwait is 9th with 2.6. And Iran is 10th on this list with 2.5 million. Now this list shows which countries are the largest exporters of oil. And you can see that despite being the world's largest producer of oil, the USA is actually coming in at number 6 in terms of exports because it's using a lot of that oil in its home market. And the position is even more accentuated for China, which is the sixth largest producer in the world, but doesn't even rank in the top 15 in terms of exports because China is one of the biggest markets for purchasing oil and therefore is using all of its own oil production in its home market. And another really interesting point to note is that the country that has the largest reserves of oil out of any in the world is Venezuela. But Venezuela is not included in the top 15 exporters because of the global sanctions that have been applied against the country. So what this chart shows us is that the price of oil is predominantly influenced by the countries that are exporting the most oil because that's the market for oil. If you're producing and consuming your own oil, then that doesn't really affect the international prices because your oil is not being made available for sale to anybody else. And if we run through this list of the top 15 exporters, the countries that are included in OPEC Plus are Saudi Arabia at number one, Russia at number two, Iraq at number four, UAE at number five, Kuwait at number 8, Nigeria at number 9, Libya at number 11, Angola at number 12, Oman at number 13, Mexico at number 14, and Kazakhstan at number 15. So 11 of the top 15 exporters in the world are included in OPEC+. Plus. And on a combined basis, this accounts for more than 50% of all exports of oil. So this group of countries has a really big influence on what happens to the price of oil. As a direct result of the ongoing contraction in the global economy and the gloomy forecasts that have been set for the rest of 2022 and 2023, the OPEC plus countries have had a meeting and decided that they are going to reduce the amount of oil production that they are collectively exporting by 2%, which equates to around 2 million barrels per day. Now, the main reason that they're doing this is that oil prices have recently fallen below $90 per barrel, and they believe that in view of potential weakening demand for oil, if output remains as it is, then that will lead to further price declines. So the main driver behind these cuts is to try to keep the price of oil at an elevated level. And the reason for doing that is obviously that these countries have large volumes of oil and they want to maximize their revenue. They want to get as much money as possible. So if prices fall, it's in their interest to reduce the supply so that prices stay at an optimal level from their perspective. And this is a classic example of supply and demand. If you follow the channel, you'll know that I often talk about the very basic principles of economics that if you've got a product that people want to buy if you increase the supply then generally the price will go down because there's more supply than demand 
And if you reduce the supply, then the price will generally go up because it means there's less available, more people want to buy it, and therefore they're prepared to pay a higher price. And oil is a great example of how supply and demand work because generally speaking, there is a high amount of demand for oil on an ongoing basis. Now, the reason that these countries are wanting to reduce the supply is that they are expecting that demand for oil will start to fall over the next three to six to 12 months. As we see the impact of higher interest rates that have been introduced over the last few months hitting various economies around the world, it will mean that people have less disposable income, companies will have less disposable cash as well, and therefore everybody will need to start tightening their belts. And we might see individuals cutting back, not going on as many optional journeys, not using their cars and vans as much, and therefore the demand for oil would fall. And if supply stays where it is, then that means that we would see continuation of the fall in oil prices. And the oil producing countries don't want that. They would rather have a fall in oil revenues as a result of a reduction in the amount that they're selling rather than the sales price coming down because it means that they can conserve their stocks they can hold on to that oil and release it into the market when the prices are more attractive now the usa has been highly critical of this move and doesn't agree that opec plus should be reducing its production it would prefer to see the global price of oil coming down rather than reducing the supply to keep prices up and one of the reasons that the USA wants to do that is that it doesn't want to see Russia benefiting from higher prices. Russia is one of the biggest exporters of oil globally. And although a lot of sanctions have been applied against the country by the West, it's currently trying to replace all of those lost sales by increasing its exports to China and India and the rest of the world. And if prices remain high, then that overall will be a benefit for Russia because even though they're having to sell their oil at a discount right now, if the price is a high price, then the discounted price will still represent good revenue for Russia. If we see a general fall in oil prices and Russia has to discount against those falling prices, then that will mean a further contraction in oil revenues for Russia. And from the USA's perspective, in order to maximize the benefit of the sanctions against Russia, they would rather see a fall in global oil prices because that will cause the maximum amount of pain for Russia. Cutting oil production to maintain prices at a higher level overall will benefit Russia and weaken the impact of the sanctions. For the past 20 years, the USA has been opposed to the concept of OPEC controlling the global price of oil by reducing or increasing the amount that it produces. And one way that it's been considering challenging this arrangement is by introducing a law that would enable the USA to take all of the countries of OPEC to international courts and sue them for anti-competitive practices. Now, the proposed legislation is rather amusingly called NOPEC, which stands for No Oil Producing or Exporting Cartels. And for the past 20 years, this bill has been repeatedly rejected by the US Senate. However, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the situation has changed. The OPEC bill would change US antitrust law to revoke the sovereign immunity that has protected OPEC Plus members and their national oil companies from lawsuits. If signed into US law, the US Attorney General would gain the option to sue the oil cartel or its members, such as Saudi Arabia, in federal court. The concept of NOPEC has been repeatedly rejected for more than 20 years due predominantly to the concerns raised by Saudi Arabia, the leading member of OPEC. However, the bill was passed by the Senate Judiciary Committee in May 2022 and now requires a consensus of 60% of Senate members in order to become formal law. So the USA is now trying to stop OPEC Plus from being able to manipulate oil prices. But there are some major risks associated to this. Firstly, Saudi Arabia is a big investor into the USA. So if this comes into effect and the USA decides that they want to take Saudi Arabia to the international courts, that would obviously sour the relationship and then would potentially cause the USA to lose that investment. In addition to that, Saudi Arabia is a big buyer of arms from the USA and it could potentially then start looking at the USA's biggest competitor, which is Russia, for producing arms. But the biggest potential impact that the USA faces is that if they try to sue the OPEC countries, the OPEC countries could decide to follow Russia's lead and start to move away from the petrodollar. So at the moment, all international deals for oil are priced in US dollars. 
And that's one of the reasons why the US dollar is currently strong, because a lot of deals that are being done for oil need to be settled in dollars. But Russia has been trying to break that monopoly. They've been trying to get countries to agree to do deals for oil in rubles rather than dollars, which from Russia's perspective would be more attractive because they then don't have to worry about the exchange rate between the Russian ruble and the US dollar. And if the rest of OPEC decided to follow suit, and for example, they agreed that the ruble was a better benchmark going forward than the US dollar, then that would obviously have a big impact on the demand for dollar. It potentially could cause the value of the dollar to fall. But more importantly, it would break the US's dominant position right now of being the go-to currency for all trade deals and also the currency that people have most confidence in. So from Russia's perspective, I am absolutely positive that President Putin will see this as an opportunity to try to negotiate with all of these other OPEC plus countries to move away from the dollar and get closer to Russia. So this actually could work to Russia's favour if the rest of OPEC plus decides that the US is being too aggressive and that they want to do something about that. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because the price of oil is absolutely critical to the global economy. Most economies around the world are dependent on fossil fuels still. There are a few countries that have managed to get their renewable energies to such an extent that they aren't as dependent, but the vast majority of the big countries in the world are still highly dependent on oil and gas and coal. And the price of oil either directly or indirectly feeds through to the price of virtually everything. So it's still a really critical metric. And in today's video, we've talked about two different policies that will have completely different impacts on the global economy. I started today's video talking about the proposed price cap on Russian oil. Now this price cap is being designed as part of the package of sanctions. So it's a penal measure on Russia. It's designed to reduce the amount of revenue that Russia earns in order to encourage them to stop the war in Ukraine. That's the whole ethos behind it. But the bottom line would be that if it was imposed and if every country in the world agreed to it, and that's really the only way that it could work, because if Russia can sell to countries who are not agreeing to the price cap, then they'll happily sell at the market rate and still earn full value for that oil. But in theory, if every country signed up for it, so India and China said, yes, we will only agree to take oil from Russia if it's at a discounted rate and everybody's happy with that figure, then that would effectively force Russia to have to do those deals because they have to find markets for that oil. They simply can't store it. And the benefit that that would offer to the global economy is that those people who are buying that oil would be able to buy it at a lower rate and therefore it would bring inflation down in all of those countries and that lower price would start filtrating through into the global economy and bring prices back down. So overall, it would be good news for the global economy. It would be bad news for Russia, obviously, because they would be the ones taking a massive hit in terms of revenues, but for everybody else it would be a benefit. Now in terms of the decision that OPEC have made with regards to the reduction of their output, that will have the opposite impact. OPEC are concerned about oil prices because they all own a lot of oil. So they don't want to start giving away oil at lower prices. And their preference, rather than doing that, is to actually reduce their output so that prices stay high and therefore maintains the future value of all of their oil reserves. But it's really bad news for the global economy because the reason that demand for oil is contracting is because we're moving into a global recession. So a lot of economies are starting to struggle. GDP is either flatlining or decreasing. And so people and businesses are watching what they're spending and everybody's cutting out non-essential travel. So demand for oil is falling because we've all got less cash. And the fact that they've now decided to cut output, so basically reduce the supply in order to push prices up, it's going to make things worse because the oil that you do have to buy, if you're buying gasoline for your vehicle, is going to cost you more and therefore you may need to find ways of avoiding other journeys. So this could become a vicious circle whereby demand keeps contracting, OPEC keep contracting the amount of output in order to maintain higher prices and therefore the prices feed through to the economies and people have less money and so it will go on. So there is a danger here that OPEC, by cutting production, 
could actually speed up the global recession and make it considerably worse for everybody. Now, the USA has come out and condemned OPEC's decision to reduce the output, and they're now talking about gaining full approval through the Senate for a law to be able to sue all of the OPEC countries. But I think in reality, it's very unlikely that that will work. Firstly, it will take an incredibly long period of time. Anything that goes through the international law courts will take years to actually conclude. So it won't solve any problems in the short term. It is a threat, obviously, so some of the countries in OPEC may discuss it as an agenda topic, but it's unlikely that they would want to be bullied by the USA, and I think the most likely outcome is that OPEC will carry on doing what they're doing. But the negative side of potential court action is that it could encourage all of those OPEC countries to move away from the dollar. And realistically, I don't think the US would want that. The greenback is seen by everybody as the safest currency in the world. It's the go-to currency whenever there are global disasters. And that's one of the reasons why the dollar is trading so highly at the moment, because everybody feels comfortable holding it. If oil deals start to be done in currencies other than the dollar, then most likely that would have a detrimental impact on the dollar and lead to a big reduction in value. And I doubt the USA will want that. Now, the other factor with regards to oil prices that I haven't touched on yet in this video is the ongoing war in Ukraine. The volatility that we've seen since the invasion started has been really quite pronounced. And although prices have started to come down over the last few months, that's been driven by a slowdown in the global economy. So that's obviously for negative reasons. Now, the longer that this war goes on, the more uncertainty that everybody will have with regards to the global supply of oil. Russia, whether you like it or not, is one of the biggest suppliers. They're being sanctioned, so a lot of countries around the world are no longer looking to buy Russian oil. So Russia is having to find new places to sell it. And the people who've banned Russian oil are now needing to find other places to buy their oil from. So there's a big merry-go-round going on at the moment. And the longer the war goes on, the longer these sanctions will stay in place and the more volatility that we will see in prices. And announcements such as the reduction in production from OPEC have a big impact on the market. So we've seen oil prices bounce back up and that will continue as long as this war carries on. And as I've said in other videos, there is no end in sight right now. So it's likely that oil prices will stay volatile. It's likely that they'll stay high because OPEC are trying to keep it high. If Russia decides to withdraw any of its supplies, then that's going to push prices up further. I mentioned earlier in the video that the Russian minister had said that prices could get as high as $200. I don't think we'll get to those levels, but it's entirely possible that we can see prices going back above $100 and staying there. And if that does happen, then the impact on the global recession that's potentially coming in 2023 will be much worse because everybody needs to keep buying oil and gas and coal. And if all of those prices stay at high levels, then that's going to keep inflation up around the world at the same time as we've got rising interest rates. And that's going to be a double whammy for everybody. So the bottom line here is that the longer that this war goes on, the worse it will be. So the overall summary of today's video is that there is potentially some good news coming through with regards to the price cap albeit the final details have not been nailed down and everybody hasn't formally agreed to it. But there's some negative news coming through with regards to OPEC's response to the fall in oil prices. The reason that oil prices are falling is because demand's coming down. So really, in order to help the global economy, we need those prices to come down to a more acceptable level so that we can all afford to buy oil. The fact that OPEC are stopping that, they're putting in an artificial measure, reducing supply in order to push the price back up, is going to penalise everybody that has to buy oil. And that is potentially going to make the global recession in 2023 worse than it should be. So hopefully you found today's episode to be interesting, educational and thought provoking. That's the idea. I want to get you guys thinking about what the impact of all of these announcements will be on your life. And hopefully you can see from today's video that what happens with OPEC, which are in countries that you may never have even visited, can have an impact on your daily life because it will impact on the price of oil and gasoline and basically the price of everything because it feeds through into every economy. So I'll keep you posted on any further news and events that I think are interesting and relevant. If you've liked what I've said today, please give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already.